This is The Critical Thinker, episode 13. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Kevin DeLaPlante, and this is The Critical Thinker Podcast, a show that explores what it means to be an independent critical thinker. In my day job, I teach philosophy at Iowa State University, where I'm also, at the time of this recording at least, chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. I use this podcast to share my thoughts on what critical thinking is and why it's important. You can find show notes and leave comments on the podcast episodes at www.criticalthinkerpodcast.com. I also run a membership website called the Critical Thinker Academy that has video tutorials and quizzes on a wide range of topics related to critical thinking. You can find those tutorials at www.criticalthinkeracademy.com. The Academy also has a members-only discussion forum where you can share your thoughts, ask questions, and so on. Okay, last episode, episode 12, was about cognitive biases, what they are, and why critical thinkers should become more familiar with them. At the end of that episode, I promised that next episode, episode 13, I would give a bunch more examples of cognitive biases. Well, I have to confess, I've had a hard time finishing that episode. Most because I wanted to do a really good job and make sure all the examples I was using were well-researched which ended up being time-consuming. And it turned out to be a very busy time at my job, so, long story short, that episode isn't quite done yet. But I didn't want to go any longer without a new podcast episode, so I decided to reach back into the archives for a topic that I had originally developed for a podcast episode last summer, but never actually used. I uploaded it in chunks to my YouTube channel, but never released it as a podcast episode. I had two reasons for not releasing it at the time. One, it was over 20 minutes long which was a lot longer than the episodes I was doing at the time. And I was worried that it was too long. And two, it was a mailbag episode. The whole episode was devoted to answering a single email question. And the question was very specific and philosophical. And I thought that content-wise, it was a little dense and just didn't fit very well with the set of ideas that I was trying to develop in the previous podcast episodes. Well, it's still long and it's still fairly dense, but I'm going to release it anyway and leave it up for you to decide whether it was worth listening to. The topic is causation, God, and the Big Bang, and specifically about whether we need to appeal to God to explain the origins of the physical universe, and even more specifically, whether it makes sense to say that God caused the creation of the universe if space and time itself didn't exist until the universe had come into being. Now, in my response, I don't try to answer this question definitively. My whole focus is on developing a critical perspective on the question so that we're in a better position to think about the different answers that people have offered. Okay, one final thing before we get going. The video version of this episode has a lot of references that aren't mentioned in the audio version. So if you're interested in references, I've got them all compiled in the show notes for episode 13 on www.criticalthinkerpodcast.com. So feel free to check those out. Well, okay, without further ado, here is that unaired episode. One of the things I want to do with the podcast is every now and then spend a show responding to listener questions. Well, the other week I got an email from my YouTube friend Theophage, and he had a question about simultaneous causation and the role it might play in a critique of an argument for the existence of God. After thinking about it, I thought this would be a good one for a video response. So Theophage writes, For several months now, I've been arguing that simultaneous causation is impossible, or at the very least, it doesn't happen in our world. I have a refutation of the Kalam cosmological argument based on the idea that A, causation is a purely temporal phenomenon, but also that B, causes need to come before their effects rather than in the same instant as their effect. The problem that I'm having is that I'm unable to find much in the way of references or philosophical discussions on the matter of simultaneous causation on the internet. Because of this, I am finding it difficult to support my position, and yet all of my opponents, whom I've argued this with, don't seem to be able to back up their arguments by references either. Is there any way you can help me with this? Well, I'm happy to try. Let's just set the context so that viewers who aren't familiar with the Kalam argument understand what the broader debate is about and why the question of simultaneous causation is relevant. So, the Kalam argument is a species of what are called cosmological arguments for the existence of God as the creator of the universe. A cosmological argument is an argument that moves from premises about the existence of the universe to the conclusion that there is a God who is the creator or sustainer of the universe. William Lane Craig is most responsible for popularizing the Kalam cosmological argument. When you see this term in print, it'll likely have his name attached to it somewhere. But he didn't originate it. It's a very old argument. The term Kalam comes from a tradition of Islamic philosophy. 
There's a big literature on it, but the basic argument is pretty simple. It goes like this. If something comes into existence at some finite time in the past, then its coming into existence has a cause. The universe began to exist at some finite time in the past. Therefore, the universe is coming into existence has a cause. Now, if this argument is compelling, then we can conclude that something had to cause the universe to come into existence. And rationality demands that we ask what could possibly function as a cause of the universe coming into being. Now, of course, you need additional argumentation to conclude that this something is the god of Christianity and Judaism and Islam. But this is the crucial first stage of the argument. Now, premise two is a relatively uncontroversial claim. It's central to the Big Bang model of cosmology, which has almost universal support among cosmologists. There is overwhelming evidence that the universe originated in a very hot, very dense state at some finite time in the past, between 13 and 14 billion years ago, and that it's been expanding and cooling ever since. The interesting premise is the first one, which states a general metaphysical principle, that if a thing comes into existence, then it must have a cause. Now here's how Theophage's refutation strategy is going to go. He wants to say that the universe is coming into existence as a special event that by its nature is going to violate this metaphysical principle. Why? Because if we follow the standard interpretation of Big Bang cosmology, the beginning of the universe also marks the beginning of time itself. It's the beginning of temporal succession. And that means that we can't talk about moments of time prior to the first moment, the moment of the universe coming into being, because there are no such moments. So Theophage wants to say that if there are no moments of time prior to the beginning of the universe, then there can be no cause of the universe's coming into being. Why? Because causation is by its nature a temporal process. Causes necessarily precede, they come before their effects. But we've just agreed that nothing can come before the universe is coming into being, since that beginning marks the first moments of time. Hence it follows that the universe's coming into being doesn't have a cause, it's an uncaused event and the calm argument can't get off the ground. Okay, so what does this have to do with simultaneous causation? Well, one way that a defender of the calm argument can respond to this objection is to say that causation doesn't necessarily have to be a temporal process, with causes always preceding their effects. Maybe it makes sense to say that sometimes causes can occur simultaneously with their effects. So if we grant this, then the defender can say, maybe the cause of the universe is coming into being occurred simultaneously with the universe's coming into being. At that very first moment, some kind of causal power was at work that simultaneously brought the universe into existence. Now, if we grant this possibility, this takes the steam out of Theophage's objection because it gives room for God or some other causal agent to enter the picture to function as the causal explanation of the universe. So what Theophage wants to do is block this move by giving an argument against simultaneous causation. It's a long way around, but this is how I understand the motivation for Theophage's question. He wants information on the status of the concept of simultaneous causation in philosophy and in physics. Do people generally reject it? Do they accept it? What's going on? Well, I'm going to try to answer that question. But first, Theophage also has a couple of arguments of his own against simultaneous causation that he wanted to run past me. So I'd like to look at these first before I forget them. Here's Theophage's first argument. Given the known laws of physics, any kind of transfer of energy, say from one ball hitting another, must take a non-zero amount of time. So for every kind of physical cause, like a ball hitting another ball, there is a necessary lag between cause and effect. Simultaneous causation is thus impossible. I like how clear this argument is. So this is how I would formalize it a bit. Premise 1, every kind of physical cause involves a transfer of energy. Premise 2, transfers of energy always take a non-zero amount of time. Therefore, every kind of physical cause takes a non-zero amount of time, which is just to say that every kind of physical cause is not simultaneous with its effect. Now, this first premise asserts something very specific about the nature of physical causation. And there are philosophers and physicists who think along these lines, but I just want to note here that this kind of physicalist analysis of causation is not the only game in town. But I'll come back to this later. My first thought is, even if we grant the two premises... I see a problem here with the relevance of the argument to the specific case in mind, namely the origin of the universe. Even if we grant that every physical cause involves a transfer of energy, there's good reason to think that whatever the nature of the causal agent is that might be responsible for the universe coming into being, it's probably not an ordinary physical cause. The cause of the universe coming into existence isn't going to be like a baseball bat hitting a baseball. So to that extent, I don't think a defender of the Kalam argument is going to find this compelling since they're already thinking of the cause of this first event as a very special kind of cause. 
But Theophage has another argument against simultaneous causation. Here it is. Further, we assume that a thing cannot cause itself to come about or exist, because the thing would have to exist before it existed in order to be a cause for its existence. Included in that is the assumption that causes have to come temporally prior to their effects. Naturally, it is a logical contradiction for a thing to exist before it exists. But if simultaneous causation is allowed, then the thing does not need to exist before it exists, only simultaneously with its own existence, which by definition everything does anyway. So it would seem that if simultaneous causation is allowed, then things are also allowed to cause themselves, and yet we don't see this happening around us. Now the first paragraph just restates the basic objection that I paraphrased earlier. It's the second paragraph that's interesting to me. What I'm getting out of these paragraphs is this argument. Premise 1. If causation can be simultaneous, then a thing can cause itself to exist simply in virtue of coexisting with itself. Premise 2. But by definition, everything coexists with itself. 3. Thus, if causation can be simultaneous, then things are allowed to cause themselves. 4. But we don't see this happening around us. Therefore, conclusion, causation cannot be simultaneous. Here I'm not as confident that I understand the reasoning or precisely what's being asserted, but assuming this is halfway accurate, here are my thoughts. It seems like you want to say that from the fact that effects can be simultaneous with their causes, it follows that things can cause themselves to exist. I just don't see how this follows. It might be true that if a thing causes itself to exist, then both the cause and effect must act simultaneously. But the converse surely doesn't follow. If both the cause and effect act simultaneously, it doesn't follow that the thing must or is able to cause itself to exist. A might imply B, but it doesn't follow that B implies A, and I think this argument relies on B implying A. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about Theophage's arguments against simultaneous causation. I don't think they win the day, but that doesn't mean that there aren't compelling arguments to be had against simultaneous causation. And that gets us to his question about the status of this concept in philosophy and physics. So there's two questions here, really. Is there a consensus on the status of simultaneous causation in philosophy? And is there a consensus on the status of simultaneous causation in physics? The answer, I think, is no to both questions. So I'll try to elaborate a bit here. First, there's no consensus on simultaneous causation in philosophy. But this is hardly surprising since there's no consensus on causation in philosophy. Causal reasoning is widespread in science and philosophy, and there's a good deal of agreement about what counts as good or bad causal reasoning in specific disciplines. But if you dig deeper, you'll see that while there's a general agreement that causation is a relation of some kind between things we call causes and things we call effects, there's no agreement on what causes and effects are fundamentally or what the causal relation is fundamentally. You can carve up the various schools of thought in a variety of ways. Your basic intro philosophy lecture on causation will probably start off distinguishing two broad camps, humans about causation and non-humans about causation. So Humean theories of causation are inspired by the 17th century Scottish philosopher David Hume's analysis of causation. He argued that when we say that A causes B, we're saying that whenever events of type A occur, they're always followed by events of type B. But for Hume, this is just a way of labeling a certain kind of regularity in the patterns of observable phenomena. Most importantly, he interprets the necessity of causal claims, the feature of a causal relation whereby A somehow necessitates B, as a feature not of the world itself, but of our psychology, about our learned expectations built up through repeated observations of B following A. Now, when I call a theory of causation a Humean theory, I'm not saying that it agrees with Hume's analysis of causation. What I'm saying is that Humean views have a certain family resemblance that shares certain features of Hume's approach. What they share is this. Humean views want to keep the analysis of causal relations at the level of patterns and observable phenomena, or at the level of our theoretical representations of the world, and they shy away from talking about causes or causal laws in metaphysical terms as part of the furniture of the world. Now, non-Humean approaches, on the other hand, embrace the metaphysical path. They want to identify causal relations with relations between properties or entities or processes in the world itself. They think there is a causal structure to the world itself, and the task of a philosophical analysis of causation is to identify the ground of this causal structure. For example, when Theophage says that every physical cause involves a transfer of energy, he's implicitly working in one of these non-Humean traditions. In fact, there is a respectable school of thought about causation that wants to analyze causal relations in terms of causal processes, and analyze causal processes in terms of energy transfer. 
This is sometimes called the conserved quantity theory of causation, since it identifies every causal process with the exchange of a conserved quantity. Energy is a conserved quantity in physics, or mass energy if you're being precise. So is linear momentum, so is electrical charge, and so on. Now, I don't want to endorse any of these views here. My point is just that critical thinking about causation requires that we know something about the landscape of alternative theories of causality that are out there. And we shouldn't be surprised that a question about causation, like can causes be simultaneous with their effects, will be answered very differently depending on which theory we're using. So coming back to simultaneous causation, let me give you an example. On David Hume's own account of causation, there can be no simultaneous causation by definition since he defines the causal relation in terms of patterns of the temporal ordering of events, where events of type B always follow events of type A. Now, if you're thinking that this seems like a pretty cheap way of settling the issue, I'm on your side. But Hume actually has some other more substantive arguments against simultaneous causation. He argues, for example, that if effects were simultaneous with their causes, then you could never have a temporally extended causal chain. So if event 1, a cause, is simultaneous with event 2, the effect, and event 2 is a simultaneous cause of, of event 3, and event 3 is a simultaneous cause of event 4, then event 1 and event 4, at the end of that chain, are also going to be simultaneous. And so will any event, no matter how far down the chain. So it seems that, on this view, every causally connected event is simultaneous, and no event can ever be causally connected to any event at any other moment of time. But that seems like a crazy result. For Hume, the possibility of a temporally extended chain of events actually rests on his belief that time is atomistic, that it has the smallest indivisible unit, and time intervals are made up of sequences of this smallest unit. I mention this because I want to come back to it later when we talk about simultaneous causation in physics, since this is an argument that actually needs to be addressed if we think that simultaneous causation is plausible. Okay, let's talk about physics. I'm going to say about physics basically what I said about philosophy that there's no consensus on simultaneous causality in physics, that how you think about the question is going to be a function of what you understand causality to be. Now for physics, you have the additional complication that a lot of people think that the concept of causation actually plays very little, if any, role in fundamental physics. But we'll say more about that later. So let's start the discussion with some simple candidates for simultaneous causation. You imagine a lead ball resting on a cushion where the weight of the ball causes an indentation in the cushion. The claim is that the downward force of the ball is a continuing event that is causing the continuing indentation, and that the cause and the effect are occurring simultaneously. Another example is the glow of a heated metal bar. We say that the temperature of the bar causes the bar to glow, but these are ongoing processes that are occurring at the same time. Now, if you don't like simultaneous causation, then you're going to argue that this description isn't quite right. When you look at the physics in detail, you'll want to say that what we have here is an equilibrium situation where certain phenomena are occurring simultaneously, but changes in those phenomena, like changes in the weight of the ball or the temperature of the metal bar, don't produce instantaneous changes in the shape of the cushion or the brightness of the light emitted from the bar. There's always a lag between cause and effect, so this isn't really an example of simultaneous causation. Now, another reason for skepticism about simultaneous causality in physics comes from relativity theory. If the world is governed by relativistic principles, then the speed of light is the cosmic speed limit, and there can be no causal interaction between spatially separated simultaneous events. For some people, this is enough to rule out simultaneous causation within physics end of story. On the other hand, there have been some explicit defenses of simultaneous causation in physics. I dug up a paper from my office files by Michael Humer and Ben Kovitz called causation is simultaneous and continuous. Their view is that in physics, causal relations are described by the laws of physics, which they interpret as causal laws. So if you look at Newton's second law, for example, it says that changes in a body state of motion, either speeding up or slowing down or changing direction, are caused by the net forces acting locally on the body, and as the forces change, the body state of motion changes simultaneously. They also argue that in order to avoid the problem with extended causal chains that I mentioned earlier, if we accept simultaneous causation, we also have to accept that causal processes don't occur at moments of time, but are actually extended over time, so that causes and effects should be viewed as extending over time and overlapping. I'm not going to say anything more about this paper by Humer and Kovitz, and I'm not endorsing its conclusions. I'm just using it to point out that there are defenses of simultaneous causation in the literature. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is something I mentioned earlier, 
about a not uncommon attitude that physicists and philosophers of physics have about causation and the role that causal concepts play in fundamental physics. This attitude makes you think twice about the whole notion of trying to ground a theory of causation in physics. What's the attitude? Well, the most famous expression of this attitude comes from the philosopher Bertrand Russell, who wrote an essay in 1913 called On the Notion of Cause, and this is what he writes. Quote, All philosophers of every school imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms or postulates of science. Yet, oddly enough, in advanced sciences such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never appears. To me, it seems that the reason why physics has ceased to look for causes is that, in fact, there are no such things. The law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy, only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. Now, the idea he's getting at is this. The most basic laws and principles of physics aren't framed as causal claims of the form A causes B, but rather as differential equations. What these equations describe are relations of functional dependency between variables, force, mass, acceleration, charge, momentum, energy, and so on. And what's important about this notion of functional dependency is that, and this has become clear over the past hundred years, at the most fundamental level, these functions are time-symmetric. What this means is that if you take the time variable in these equations and reverse it, the equations still have viable solutions, so the equations themselves don't distinguish between processes running forward in time and processes running backward in time. Now, as a matter of fact, we know that many physical processes that, that we observe do have a directionality to them. Ice cubes melt at room temperature, they don't spontaneously reform into ice cubes. So we know that irreversible processes enter the picture at some level, and this irreversibility seems to be related in some way to our common sense intuitions about the direction of time. But the puzzle has been how to understand the origins of time irreversibility when the fundamental laws of physics are all time reversible. Now this is a long-standing question in physics and the philosophy of physics. Many books and articles have been written on it. And there's no consensus answer to this question. So many have concluded with Russell that physics might just be the wrong place to look even for an explanation of the directionality of time and change, much less to look for a foundation for universal law of causality. Now I would say that a lot of the recent philosophical work on the relationship between physics and causality seems to accept this pessimistic outlook. But not everyone agrees that physics or science can or should try to get rid of the concept of causation entirely. In fact, most don't. Scientists, including physicists, use the concept of cause and effect all the time. It would be hard to imagine what science would look like without it. So the challenge has been to give an account of causation that acknowledges that our use of causal concepts can't be grounded in fundamental physics, but at the same time seeks to explain and justify our use of these concepts in science and everyday life. I think that on this issue, the focus has shifted to looking at how and why we represent the world in causal terms. And a view that is gaining some popularity is that the naturalness of representing the world in causal terms is best understood as a consequence of our perspective as agents who intervene in the world, make plans and decisions, and so forth. Now, this approach to causation falls into the Humean category broadly construed. Again, I'm not endorsing this view. I'm just trying to describe the state of discussion on these issues as I see them. Now, what's the upshot of all this for the original question, which was about simultaneous causation and its application to the origins of the universe? Well, I think your options break down like this. If you're a non-human about causation, let's say you're working with something like the conserved quantity approach, then I think reasonable people can disagree on whether causation can be simultaneous. A lot turns on how you define the causal relation and the sorts of things that can function as causes and effects. However, I don't see how the conserved quantity approach gives you any traction at all in thinking about the origins of the universe itself when you don't have any conserved quantities to start with, right? Now, if you're in the Humean camp, then you'll likely be very skeptical of the very idea of applying causal concepts to describe the origin of the universe. On your view, the application of these concepts is grounded at some level in human agency and human representations. They're not given in the fabric of the world itself. So I can't see how this approach would be helpful either. So I think the situation is grim if what you want to do is use contemporary views of causation to ground a position one way or the other on causal explanations of the origins of the universe. Now, does all of this pose a problem for defenders of the Kalam cosmological argument? I'm not sure it does. I think defenders of the Kalam argument might respond by saying that when they say that anything that comes into being has a cause for its coming into being, 
they're not really interested in subsuming this notion under contemporary views of causation. What they're doing is more like wrapping some causal language around a more basic metaphysical principle, some version of the principle of sufficient reason, which says roughly that for every event or true fact, there is a sufficient reason why the event occurred or why the fact is true. So what they'll say is that the origins of the universe at some finite time in the past is an event that demands explanation in terms of some sufficient reason. And they won't care so much whether you call it a causal explanation or some other kind of explanation. So I think they'd be happy to grant all of these critiques of causation and causal concepts that we've been talking about, and they'll dig in at a more fundamental level and defend the core metaphysical intuition that underlies the first premise of the Kalam argument. And then the proper response from a critic will be to challenge this underlying metaphysical intuition on its own terms. That's how I see this playing out, anyway. All right, that's the end of our previously unaired podcast episode. If your head hurts after all that, then I apologize. I know it's a lot to process if you're not already a student of these topics. On the other hand, I like mailbag episodes every once in a while. So if you've got a question, feel free to send it my way. It may end up on a podcast episode. I'll try my best to answer the question one way or another. So next episode, we're going to come back to cognitive biases, I promise. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.